Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? Among the news items we have for you this week, data out of France for the RSV vaccine safety, X-ray images from various vehicle accidents that will make you squirm uncomfortably, the fragrance products could be causing early puberty in females, the FDA has approved another part of the Neuralink product line. A 33kg meth haul has been identified as a not strongest case in an Australian courtroom. And cannabis is related to cardiovascular use according to one study, but take it with a considerable amount of salt. Other Australian news has social media possibly being fined for the facilitation of misinformation. Drug resistant bacteria are expected, and we use that word tenuously, to kill tens of millions by 2050. A bizarre overlap between science and fashion and artificial robotic muscles. The timestamps for these and other news items can be found in the description box below. Starting with news that will annoy anti vaxxers, with the upcoming RSV season, that basically being winter in the Northern Hemisphere, there is increasing data available to show just how beneficial the vaccine for it is and why you should be using it for infants. The one caveat to this is that this is coming out of France, and as such, we're not entirely sure if the French RSV vaccine has been putting up the white flag and surrendering, or if it's actually working. The stale jokes about France aside, it is undeniable that this vaccine is beneficial. The simple reality is, is that RSV has a significant effect on both very young children, primarily infants, and the elderly. Therefore, the fact that we've had at least a year's worth of data now on its efficacy means we can say with great confidence that there is indeed not just benefit, but clearly quantifiable benefit. Not just the usual, oh, we think it's good, or based on the general processes, etc, etc, etc. No, no, here are actual numbers, and therein lies the key. Of the the roughly 700 infants who met the criteria to be tested for RSV, about 400 were positive for it. Now this does mean you had about a 4 to 3 ratio of possibly diagnosed and confirmed diagnoses. 1% of them had different kinds and 18% were negative for this, and so once you get some little fancy statistics and math involved, you find that being vaccinated comes out at about 90% effective at preventing hospitalizations. Now, that's pretty good. Admittedly, it's only about 13% better than pre-licensure data, but nonetheless, that's still an improvement for almost no risk. And especially when you compare the fact that you're protecting children from something fairly major. And as such, deciding to vaccinate is a good idea. What is not a good idea is having vehicle accidents, and we have, uh, let's say, uh, two case studies, to describe them very kindly and diplomatically, that should tell you why vehicle accidents are a terrible idea. The first involves a uh, man and a motorbike. The 33-year-old man did not ever learn the uh, proper way the song goes, something to the effect of, the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone's connected to the hip bone, and no, he decided he'd learn the version of this that goes, the thigh bone head is attached or embedded in the scrotum after a motorbike accident. It gives a new meaning to the term boner. Yeah. Admittedly, they only identified this after examination wherein the patient had been intubated, basically a breathing tube down their throat, but had a... Uh, hard, swollen, and bluish scrotum. They literally had blue balls. And uh, after figuring out that uh, the leg was slightly shorter and rotated improperly, well, they figured out where the round head of the femur had gone to. And, well, they literally found a round stone-like uh, bone ball in his balls. This is why you make sure to wear your safe riding gear, and preferably ride safely or else you wind up in a situation like this. In a similar sort of news, we have the reality of what happens if, well, you choose to uh, put your legs up on the dashboard and have an accident.
much like the uh, 33-year-old man who, uh, well, uh, wound up with the uh, head of his femur in his testicles, this person wound up with just about their entire femur in this scrotum area. Although in this case, given that they're a female, that's more likely to say closer to their vagina. But whether it's a male or a female, this is not where your thigh bone should be. In fact, that's got to be one of the most disquieting places and ways for it to possibly be sitting in your body, barring it, well, being uh, shattered into small pieces, or alternatively, outside your body, and also typically in small pieces. Not to mention the fact that you have the other leg, which is in two parts, uh, typically not how your femur should be, and really not in any normal circumstances, let alone after an accident. Why this happened is fairly straightforward. Riding with your feet up on the dashboard, basically having your legs above where the not only vehicles are likely to hit you from, but airbags and other things means that, well, your legs go where they shouldn't be going at a very fast speed and with a lot of force. That's enough, as demonstrated from this particular article, to rip your bones out of their sockets and, in part, put it through places it shouldn't be. So yes, if you want to learn your anatomy and particularly the bone structures and what they connect to, this is not a good place to learn. In uh, other things you might want to learn about, a, a new blood group has been discovered. Sort of, anyway. It's more the answer to a 50-year-old mystery than it is an actual answer itself. It's due to the nature of how many antigens there are on the blood cell surface, the various interactions, and so on. But basically, a blood is a lot more complicated than just the ABO and rhesus system. In fact, there are a lot more various antigens that need to be considered, especially if we're talking about very complicated kinds of antibodies for, let's say, a complex transfusion cases. Hematologists tend to be much better informed on this than other people would otherwise be. The overly simplified version is that if you're given the wrong blood type, your body can have a reaction to that blood. Now, what's important here is that that reaction can occur even if it's the same blood type and not just a positive or negative version of the same blood type, but even a more refined version. That is, more specific things again that aren't covered by the simple ABO and positive-negative system. And this affects a lot of patients. In fact, the vast majority of patients who need blood will need to consider this if they get multiple transfusions. Where this particular research gets more complicated is that a lot of people get blood typed almost right after they're born. This is useful particularly if the baby needs to get any kind of surgery or otherwise has complications requiring blood. But the MAL protein, which is very small and doesn't get generated until a fair time after birth, obviously is a problem in that respect, and particularly if you want to give them blood from an adult who has been generating antibodies to this. As such, it's quite a bit of complicated hematology that they're looking into, and it can be very significant depending on exactly what's happening. Although, remembering that the vast majority of individuals, more or less 99%, don't need to worry about it, but for that 1%, it can be what saves their life. In news that's otherwise related to biology, but certainly also to human vanity, we have research claiming that some of the chemicals within cosmetic and beauty products could be leading to early puberty. Mostly the musk scent. The thing here is that there are two pretty major issues to do with the acclaimed research. The first is that the musk scent itself that they think might be responsible is banned in Europe. And as such, if you're observing the same changes there despite it being banned and theoretically not available, but also observing it in other parts of the world, as they do, it may not be responsible, or at least it may not continue to be responsible. But particularly also when we look at the kind of methods used to establish this, which is primarily blood and urine collection. The second issue is that, other than the blood and urine collection, they then uh, looked at cell culture to try and establish that what they were looking at was true, which, well, there's a very large world of difference between a collection of cells on a petri plate and, well, a whole human being, particularly when we're talking about hormones and various developments like adolescence and puberty.
Admittedly, the variety of animals they did test it in, including zebrafish, mouse cells, human cells, and various other scenarios, does lend credence to the research. It's still not enough to actually substantiate what it is they're claiming. In slightly more substantial news, we see a significantly larger part of the brain in depressed patients. It's not the emotional center, ironically enough, but rather it's the frontostriatal salience network. And try saying that three times really fast. What it's linked to is a reward processing and filtering of external stimuli. Basically, the amount of things going into your brain would theoretically be increased, but the rewards for processing that go down. So like any good corporate slave, the brain begins to feel worn down and, well, unfortunately, corporate's usual solution of the beatings will continue until morale improves doesn't work inside your brain. As such, you just see a continual downward spiral of depression, sadness, and, well, a desire to just go somewhere else and do something different. Like, build a cabin in the woods, start making a boat, a bake, or, as is always reliable, find your local pot dealer. In this case, the reason it works isn't down to any of these things, unfortunately. It's actually because of that increase in size. Remembering that it basically doubles in its volume, and the brain does have a finite space. Because of the finite space, any time it increases in size, whatever is around it is going to get squished out to some extent. And that's pretty much what they found in their relatively uh, small study. Understand, the initial research looked at 57 individuals, it was a weird comparison, and then they went and looked at data from children who also appeared to have depression. So we now have adults and children, which does somewhat help to substantiate what they're saying. But even with that in mind, they really only noticed that the expansion was pronounced in the kids rather than the adults. It was, however, pronounced in children before diagnoses meaning it may be a risk factor or a contributing factor to depression, rather than the result of. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily helpful, as it's not entirely clear if, necessarily, it could actually be used in any particular way. Shifting to a relatively short brain-related news item, the Neuralink implant has finally received a breakthrough device designation from the FDA. This is rather important, mostly down to the differences in how it can be used because it's received a designation. Fundamentally, what they've had before now was very limited, more or less one individual at a time kind of approval. You could only really use it for that one person and show those one person's results. With this, they now have much greater approval to try and work with it more flexibly. For example, the designation was able to allow them to link it to a vision device, which means that they can, in theory, give people back sight by using the neural link implant, assuming everything goes as planned, which, understand, is very, very tenuous given how novel the device is. In animal news, we have a terrifying animals, or insects more accurately, with a wasp that will break out from a Mississippi fly chest. It is quite literally the insect equivalent of the alien's chest buster. Slightly less adorable and less likely to lead to memes as well, but assuming that we're not interested in that and purely want the science, well, adult fruit flies are the primary target, and that's not a bad thing, because fruit flies are a massive pain if you have an orchard. For most other circumstances, you probably don't care. What happens is that the Centretus palmani is a, a wasp that lays its larvae within the fruit fly, and it begins growing in the adult fruit fly. As it gets bigger, well, it has to find its way out, and, well, a one way out is literally straight out through its chest. While we aren't the uh, biggest fan of the fruit fly in the wild, we certainly wouldn't wish this on them. Being parasitized and eaten from the inside out is a bit much, even for us. In a laboratory setting, it's still a bit much, but there might at least be uh, some scientific justifications. Uh, questionable justifications, but still, they could be there.
What is particularly interesting is that there was a very big difference in the number of fruit flies by sex that were infected. A parasitized might be a better word. More interestingly is that there was a substantial difference in the sex that was primarily parasitized. Of the roughly 6,000 or so male fruit flies, they had a between a 1 and 3% infection rate, or parasitization rate, whereas only 1 in 477 female fruit flies had the larvae parasitizing them, which means that there's clearly something going on with regards to the changes that occur, particularly during larval development and the adult fruit fly, that leads to the male being much more at greater risk and likely are not the same sort of behaviors that humans engage in that put them at greater risk of, well, death in general, but in this case, chest busters. In slightly dumb news related to, well, in this case, law enforcement and drugs, Australian courts have described a case wherein a woman and a man were caught traveling with 33 kilograms of meth, and yet the court has described it as not the strongest. How is a 33 kilograms of meth not a strong case? Understand, they're traveling through one of Australia's driest and hottest deserts with basically just meth. It's not like they could claim that it was for personal use. Nobody is going to use that much unless they're planning for an entire year, in which case, okay, they're being economical by buying in bulk, but that doesn't seem likely given the, uh, future planning of most drug addicts. In other drug news, uh, we have a uh, possible alteration in the use of cannabis particularly across the USA, which isn't actually that surprising. Uh, there has been a notable decrease in consumption of alcohol, but an increase in use of cannabis, mostly following the, uh, let's say, uh, changes in uh, legality of cannabis use, or whether that is purely to make it a medicinal approval, or not only medicinal but recreational approval as well. And as such, the change is not really all that surprising. But one group hasn't changed, teenagers, which probably makes a lot of sense in hindsight, primarily the fact that teenagers were already likely to be using, and as such, you can't increase using if just about everybody is using. Of course, option two is rather more simple, and that is, uh, they're 12 to 17 years old, they can't afford to buy pot at the moment, and because of that, well, if you can't buy it, you obviously can't use it. Well, at least not without some other serious complications which are unlikely to be picked up by this kind of study. The study is large scale, so it's not like we can just ignore their findings. It's about 540,000 people between 2013 and 2022. So yes, it is a fairly large-scale study. They did look at individuals from age 12 and up, and they were quizzed on, amongst other things, cannabis use over the last 30 days. So the kind of surveys we're talking about will give us a nice sample, but it is a very finite sample. The researchers themselves will basically say they can't definitively say that illegalizing cannabis is what drives this change, but they also point out that well, with 38 out of 50 US states approving it and there being a, a notable following trend of increased use across all age groups, but least amongst teenagers, with the increased number of states that are legalizing it, it's really hard to deny the correlation, even if there's not necessarily a causation established yet. And this does bring us to the uh, possible downside to cannabis use, and that it may be, and understand, we say may with a very big asterisk, be contributing to cardiovascular disease. Understand that cannabis does behave drastically different to something like, say, uh, nicotine in tobacco, and as such, the way it affects the heart and the cardiovascular system as a whole is going to be very different. The challenge is the relatively understudied nature of cannabis use. Most of the time, because those who want to research it are so busy smoking their own samples. No, it's just simply that 
trying to get people to tell you honestly what they're up to at the best of times is hard, let alone talking about something that may not at the time be legal. This brings us to the USA between 2002 and 2019, because in 2020 there was suddenly something that happened and everything got shut down, and so finishing that time frame kind of makes sense. What's key here is that they have found that there is a risk related between cannabis use and cardiovascular disease. Now, the link may not necessarily be that cannabis use causes it, but rather something related to why you're using cannabis is the thing that also contributes to your cardiovascular disease. For example, stress. This does bring us to the study itself, which is about 430,000 respondents between ages 18 and 74. On top of this, you had a fairly high rate of daily cannabis use at 4%, and 7.1% used it less than daily, but only 89% claimed to have never used it, which does leave us with a fairly large group that used it regularly enough. This also begins to muddy the waters a lot, because not just do we have a fairly diversified group, but the actual cannabis group themselves tend to have a lot of conflating problems. Alcohol use, tobacco use, and other factors that would generally contribute in various ways to cardiovascular disease. There are also some issues around the nature of the analysis they've done afterwards as well. Mostly that they seem to have been taking, arguably, somewhat odd subsets out of the study itself. For example, they looked at people who are under 55 in the case of males, but under 65 for women, and then seeing whether or not there was a uh, chronic heart disease, cardiovascular, myocardial infarct, stroke, etc. But they haven't really given a great justification for why they've used two distinct age brackets, when you would think you would use one and look at it as a, a simple, a relatively straightforward comparison. But no, no, they use different ages, which does mean that apart from the fact that this is a retrospective analysis, there are a bunch of uh, concerns about this. Not necessarily major failures, but enough to raise questions that say that the findings aren't definitive, but they also raise some pretty significant questions that need answers. In animal news that will at least make you uh, somewhat confused, much like humans, marmosets apparently have names for each other. A marmoset is basically a monkey. It's not quite the same as every other monkey you might think of, and mostly because it kind of looks like a gremlin. But that's the thing. Much like humans, they appear to have names for each other, and therefore they need to learn names and the various social relationships around each name. And it does indicate, at least in the case of marmosets, that there's a much more a complicated social structure. And not just is there the complicated social structure, but there has to be something from evolutionary terms that made it necessary to have this. And not just have the structure in a social term, but the various adaptations needed inside the marmoset for this to happen. For example, changes in brain structure, the various changes in the anatomy of the throat for the necessary vocalizations, and more. And so, we have to ask, what's going on with marmosets? Well, for now, we're not going to get a lot of detail. We can theoretically, with a deep enough and long enough investigation into this, possibly get a good understanding as to what's going on with the various adaptations and the process of evolving for partly speech, but partly the physical, anatomical, neurological, and cultural elements that are involved. In news that's less useful and demonstrates why it is perhaps that Australia is the uh, land of many questionable things, the government's put forward legislation that will fine social media companies for enabling misinformation. This is kind of concerning, as to be clear about it, a lot of what has been described as misinformation over the last few years has had uh, the questionable value after, well, up to 12 months in some cases where what was once misinformation has become actual information. And obviously, with the government being the way governments are, uh, 
the chances of them uh, backtracking on a uh, fine, for instance, for what they at one point called misinformation, it's likely they won't return that money. And it's a fair amount of money at that, 5% of global revenue. That's a lot of income. It's not the typical fines you would see put forward by most companies that do something questionable. Instead, this is purely based on revenue, and that is going to be very expensive for some companies. For example, YouTube, Facebook, possibly X. The fundamental ideas are not necessarily bad, but, well, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And that's why, even though the misinformation law is meant to target things like public health, election interference or integrity, a hate speech, or something that would provoke the injury of a person, or disrupting key infrastructure and emergency services, well, the governments have a way of twisting how any of these things are defined, and there's actually something of a lack of definition in the law from what's been understood that means that the government can basically define away whatever they're doing by simply saying, well, that's what we meant, even if that's not what we wrote. Which, yeah, that is a worry. On the other hand, this has, in some respects, balanced the current problem of a large social media and tech companies fundamentally being a law unto themselves, of course only in one very narrow and specific way. And so it's a very uh, a difficult balancing act between allowing fundamental free speech uh, while also trying to ensure that social media companies or any large technological company for that matter actually abides by national laws. Next is slightly more unusual and weird news that looks almost entirely at the ability to take microbial organisms, primarily bacteria in this case, and use them to create a neural network sort of thing and use them to compute. It's basically the uh, slightly smaller version of can you use crabs to run Doom? And the answer is yes. The way this works is similarly weird and unusual and almost completely unnecessary, but at the same time, where it goes it could be incredibly powerful and handy. The general gist of it is to take genetically engineered bacteria and allow them to act sort of like a neurosynapse, that is the receptor for signals, and by having them created in a single layer growing across a media, they can perform various tasks. Not necessarily complex tasks, but also not necessarily simple tasks. For example, can they define if a number is between 0 and 9? Is it a prime number? Is a letter between A and L a vowel? And so on. And so, the reasonably straightforward processes allow it to do much more complicated tasks once you begin figuring out just how much computational power there is in what looks, at least initially, like a fairly small thing. It's the same fundamental idea behind, well, basically computer processing units. Each individual processing unit isn't that big, but depending on how tightly you can pack them together, they can suddenly be able to do a lot more. It's why a 7 nanometer transistor is so much more powerful than a 14 nanometer transistor. In other microbial news, we have a study that claims that over the next 25 years, tens of millions will die from various drug-resistant bacteria strains. Well, they claim near 40 million people, but to be clear about it, this is both forecasting, which is always questionable, but also it relies on the fact that medication-resistant bacteria will be responsible. Now, this is not to say that they aren't a concern. Uh, to be clear, there are some worries. At the moment, those worries aren't necessarily the be-all and end-all, but they do exist. The question is whether or not we will be able to solve them in 25 years, and more than that, whether or not the actual death rate is based on just the medication resistance alone, or if there are other factors that will come into play. For example, differences in population and so on. So, unless they manage to modify what's going on beyond just an increase in medication-resistant rates of bacteria, the result's not necessarily all that reliable. To some extent, they have managed to create multiple possible future forecasts this way, 
And it does mean that you could have anywhere between one and possibly several hundred million people dying based on the infections. And of course, different countries, records, etc. So the basic research itself sounds terrifying until you look at what's going on and realize that there's a lot of uncertainty in that. In other research that really more than anything shows dedication rather than any real, let's say, uh, significance. If you flip a coin, it's more or less always going to show up on the same side that you tossed it from. Yeah, and mathematicians spend a lot of time finding some of the most useless things to do, just to prove that something that's basically been known, that you have an even chance of it happening. <laughs> Admittedly, in this case, dedication is perhaps an understatement with more than 350,000 samples. That is, 350,000 coin flips to show that what they're saying is true. In even more bizarre news, although this time solely in that uh, fashion is taking after science, uh, we have uh, various trans cell membranes showing up in fashion parades. Uh, no, really, that is there any other possible description for what this thing is? Next we go to uh, the internet of all things, although we've been there for a while now it would appear, and an article saying that, well, the internet is basically one great big dumpster fire. And for the alien who's just arrived to Earth, we'd like to introduce you to the internet as that is all it is. The thing here is that they are putting forward a way to supposedly save it, which... Ah, if you think the internet can be saved, uh, we have an invisible bridge to sell you, the Eiffel Tower is being scrapped, and the Statue of Liberty is needing some work done at it, and we've got the contract. But no, I, the general gist of what they're going to argue, if we're not mistaken, is AI, or more likely large language models, have pretty much undermined what was once a fairly productive internet. It was largely made up of porn and spam, but it was still largely productive. With the greater emergence of the free services, and free is used in very, very much inverted commas, and the commercial interests that are behind them, we've moved away from that usefulness to instead basically seeing people as a product. And because you want to sell things, rather than wanting to provide people with useful information, you want to sell them, or at least provide them with products that they want to buy. It's just one great big marketing company. And as such, the old internet is slowly dying off, as more and more of it becomes a free service that is treating its users as a product that is there for a, well, marketplace to be sold to, a captive audience of sorts. The article from the conversation is largely reasonable, except when we get to the end, and this is one of the major issues. Alternatives. For example, there are no real alternatives to YouTube, nor are there any real convenient alternatives to things like, say, uh, a Gmail, although you can use, say, a Hotmail or live accounts, but then you have companies like, say, Reddit and so on. There just isn't any real alternative for some of these, and as such, you can't vote by going elsewhere. And that's a big issue. Well, the final news item we have for you is more a blog from the Neurologica blog, or the Ness as the website is called, and it's all about, uh, well, artificial robotic muscles. Sadly, uh, not giant robots like mechas, uh, or similar, but instead, just more practical robotic muscles. For example, the Boston Dynamics robots the killer dogs with machine guns strapped to their backs, or possibly uh, killer dogs with bees in their mouths. The thing here is that current robot technology is kind of limited. It's not so much limited in that we can't make it work, it's just that, well, it's bulky, it's heavy, and it's often quite energy dependent. As a result, making things work well is kind of impractical especially when you look at just how little change there's been in a lot of the technology involved. A lot of the most basic things are the same they have been for decades, if not centuries. And as the Neurological blog goes into the details of, yeah, this is a big issue. 
we simply can't use modern robots very effectively because of that. The amount of power they can carry isn't really up to the task. By contrast, muscles, and particularly tendons instead, could be very effective at doing this because of how little energy they need relative to what they're doing, and what little energy does go in, a lot of it is able to be recovered. Because of that, you can in theory make robots much more efficient and effective. You also make them much more, let's say, a living or human, which, depending on the uh, a particular demographic and audience we're talking about, may or may not be something you're interested in. The two big challenges, and these are things brought up in the blog post itself that we agree with, are the materials that are available at present. For now, we just don't have a lot of the requisite materials to make this work very well. There are some certain things that are being developed or sort of on the way, but none of them are there yet that would allow us to make robots that have anything close to a muscle. The second issue, which is somewhat more significant, as even if we have those products, if we can't use them, it's not going to help us, is the processing ability to do so. That is, how can you develop the necessary hardware and software and have the interactions that allow it to appropriately control these things? The reason the human body can control what it does so efficiently and effectively simply comes down to the fact that, well, we have continuous input and sensation of what we're doing. It means that we can limit what we do to prevent ourselves from destroying our body, or, in other cases, destroy it deliberately in the case of, say, an adrenaline rush. But overall, we have a fine degree of control, and it means that we can ensure that whatever we get up to is only what we want, unless you have muscle control issues, in which case you're out of luck. But that's a separate issue again. That's more a pathology than an actual design defect. And so we simply can't make robotic muscles work at this point. We don't have the material science there yet, and we don't have the control there yet. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please do post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.